Did you ever work musically with Charlie? I mean, you know. Did you ever work musically with Charlie in the studio, live? I want to play and gig. Just play and gig, yeah. just double going yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah. We were friends and stuff. We were friends yeah. enough that we'd go up to the town, my wife and myself, and things like that. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, we never really did studio or anything like that. You know? One of the reasons, like, I, I, uh, me and Charlie used to pass in the hall back in the day. He's shy, I'm shy. You know, a lot of people, music, just because you're on stage, people think you're a um, whatever, extrovert. But a lot of musicians aren't, aren't, you know. But anyways, you know, I, we had never worked together. So when I did the compilation records, I was like, I'm more shy than I've ever worked with him. He's the nicest guy. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. And he did a great job. And Not like your everyday lawyer. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, and that. My line of work is a day gig. I do lawyers all the time. But no, he's he's a cool guy. He's yeah. a total stand up man. He went to the same school my wife did. We yeah. talk about that all the time. He graduated from Ohio University. Right. Uh, Ohio University. Ohio University. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. And they both have gone to the same school just about the same time, but they didn't know each other, but they talk about it when they get together. And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, you know, he, he's had an interesting you know, go, you know, and, and now he's getting some recognition that's long overdue, the need as well. Yeah. Now, you, at one point I read somewhere, at one point you were Robert Mascaro's right hand man. So if Robert would go in there and do what he did, right. you'd be a guy kind of like smooth it out and deal with him after Robert, right? <laughs> Tell us about that. You, well, you knew Robert? Huh? Did you know Robert? I was interviewed for the sick list at one point, and, uh, well, and there needed a bass player. He could be a pretty tough guy. Yeah. Well, the, my interview went with him, it was like, he was talking about the Ramones and the Sex Pistols, and I was talking about uh, uh, Talking Heads and Elvis Costello, and I had long hair and a mustache, and I was being eliminated. Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of Robert Mascaro stories, but I didn't know that you had, you know, that you had basically worked a lot. I could probably do the words Robert Mascaro stories. <laughs> yeah. Most of them are pretty good. Yeah. I like Robert. Yeah. He was a good manager. Yeah. He, he worked my ass off. You know? He did a lot of changes in, in my thought pattern about the direction of what I should be doing and stuff like that. You know, get out of the stupid to be an Elvis guy and pick up this obscure yeah. rock and roll stuff that's going to be cool and stuff, you know, like that. Yeah. He really changed a lot of my thoughts about a lot of things. I didn't like a lot of stuff, but I did. I did everything he said in. Yeah. I did because I figured, well, I can't fuck my career up anymore. Than like, you he had, a, he <laughs> had some sort of vision. Let's go try it for a while. You know? That's kind of how I feel about money managers now. You know. That's a shame because you were doing this way before fans like the Stray Cats came. Right. Yeah, you know, you you doing that way before you. Oh, well, we were happy days came out. We were so happy because that show came out because it made us all cool. We were like, yeah. doing the rockabilly thing. That was like struggling. Man. Who wants to hear some old 50s rockabilly band with, with Cleveland Mac with like that? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, I did. Anyway, <laughs> so, so the ha when Happy Days came out, it was like a shot in the arm for, right. for that type of music. I don't know. Now, I think that's a recyclical, recyclical thing, you know, because like that that, that music's never gonna die. You know, what you, what you do, I love it, you know. I, and I see Charlie like every time I see him, you know, this guy getting better and better, you know, like they know. Well, our band gets better and better too, man. The better we get, the better. We the guy I got playing guitar now, he plays good rock. You ever heard of Wayne Cochran? Oh yeah. He has Wayne oh, yeah. Cochran guitar playing with with Jocko and all <laughs> yeah. that stuff like yeah. that, and. Uh, and then all of a sudden he just fell. He played for me for like three years without just going through the motions. Okay, I can play. I'm good. And, all yeah. that stuff. and then he discovered the love of rockabilly. So yeah. all of a sudden he took all this talent that he had and the channel that he to be in a good rockabilly club. Right. And it's like all my life I fought with guitar players because they always wanted to be cool somebody else in the rockabilly. It's so simple. Yeah. I don't want to play rock and roll, man, because I, let me play my yeah, 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 and all yeah, that stuff, yeah. and I go, oh, man, I don't want that, that's not what I want, yeah. you know? So anyway, we finally got the 
100% light after we drove in the car for miles and miles, and I talked about it, and put yeah. the CDs in. And yeah. the you doctored it in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it, so it's a joy playing with these guys, because they want to they wanna play. Yeah. Where are you and playing next? We're probably playing, let me think one more time, coffee. Coffee house out in West Hollywood. We've been there about five years. Is that what it's called, the coffee house? Yeah, it's called the coffee house. Yeah. It's a coffee house, it's like a Starbucks, but they, yeah. it's a huge, it's a huge menu for the music. We've got bands and stuff every night. It's an awesome place. We've been there five years. I'll be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be there in seven, not the Halloween. Okay. Well, to eat somehow, um, I was reading, uh, I think it was Joe Harris's interview with you, when he was discussing the eat, and they would come in the studio and do a couple songs, and break up, and then come back in the studio, but, you know, they went through a period like a lot of bands do, right. and you ended up like, putting together all those recordings, and it was, uh, scattered Wahoo in action, can you tell me something like that? Is that right? i tell you what, i tell you something about it. That's not that because I didn't do anything with that. You didn't? Okay. No. So where I first met the Eat was the place called the Pipe Squeeze on Hollywood Beach over here. Yeah, yeah. Johnson Street. Uh, at my jewelry store. Right. Yeah. At my jewelry store, Eddie O'Brien's sister worked for us. She was twin, Eddie was at a bar and I can't remember what it was. One of them was for me, so she was always just telling me about the seat, and always just telling me about the site, doing this stuff. I was just thinking about trying to get my band back to play and all that, so I kept hearing about it. So I said, well, I want to go see him. And uh, she said, yeah, well, they're, they're going to play at this place. And they're called the place, right? So I said, okay, we'll go, and I'll go see him. And so, um, so we went down there. And, and she had been telling about them that I was telling them that I was going to do this and all that kind of stuff. So I got down there and they said, we need someone to run sound for us. And I said, well, I know some about it. He said, well, can you please do it? So I never really, I, mean, I was wearing the country guy in Colorado. Like, and I really never had seen any of this deep kind of music before or anything like that. Yeah. Where their idea of mixing sound is just turning everything up all the time. Right. <laughs> there was no mixing sound, there was no yeah. nothing. So they started playing and they just said turn everything up all the way and that was it. And that, I said, well, what's my job? And they said, well, that's it. You're, you're the <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so they, that's how I met those guys. They, yeah. they used to come into the store all the time because Lori was there and then there's uh, Lori's uh, boyfriend and Pepe and all of these guys, they're all like brothers and sisters, right. all and everything, yeah. you know? yeah. they going to buy jewelry and things for all their girlfriends. I mean, it was pretty neat. I knew all of them way before the scene of the scene thing. When I got back into the rock and roll and play and then go into the scene studio and all that. Was that around like 1982 around that time? That was, that was more like... 79 or 80. Okay, right, right yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. Just talking about, I ask this of everybody, do you think, you know, or would you want it to, do you think a scene like that where you had like a lot of creativity going on could happen again down here with the kind of vibe that was happening back then? Because I'm calling it the, the movie Invisible Band. The reason for the word invisible is it's a metaphor for the time, the geography, uh, not many bands, or I don't think any bands other than maybe Critical Mass and Sick was signed. Not to say that they many bands deserve to so be fair about that, but do you think the scene could uh, happen again? Or do you think? Do I think the scene could happen again? No. Uh, it's too, too diverse. Yeah. There's no coherence of one group of people. Maybe you could have like a small little niche. Oh, yeah, right. But you would not have that pull together. You could have a little bit of gold right here, there, and there, yeah. around. 